No. <laughs> do you need? Do we need a microphone? No. We're being recorded. That's not the problem. But there's two of us and only one microphone. So that means one of two things. One of us gets it and one of us don't. And you hear one of us or you don't. Or you all have to be quiet so you can hear us talk like this. So I want to set a little bit of a background here on, for people who aren't familiar with the cultural reference, every woman when she gets pregnant gets this book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. So that's what this is a allusion to. So we're going to talk, how many people here have used Expect for Unix or tried to use any sort of Expect for Windows? All right, so um, Expect is a... Ready? Yep. Expect is a tool that lets you automate <coughs> console apps and the best versions of them let you automate interactive apps. Now, you think that it might just be a Unix thing, but people all over the net are looking for it, so we got some news coverage right here. <laughs> now, there's a couple opportunities available for you on Windows, and let me show you what that kind of looks like. Really? Yep. Oh, just but, oh, there you drive. All right, I'll stand over there. Now, a, a typical expect on Windows would look like this. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it would be. Wow. What have you done? <laughs> okay, so um, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and probably it's because... This is what a typical implementation looks like on Windows. So somebody will create a process, and inside that, they'll redirect standard input and output, give it some arguments, and then now you've got this, this process that's hooked. And every time you send it a command, receive a command, it's going to be sending those commands through the standard output or standard input and receiving them from standard output. Now, the issue with this is that most apps act a lot differently when they're being used this way. When you're just redirecting standard input, standard output, they tend to go into some sort of batch mode or a mode where they don't think that they're interactive and they start to restrict a bunch of functionality. So for example, if you do this in, in PowerShell and you try to do a, you know, a read host, it's going to fail because there's no interactive host available. So this is the typical approach. If you look for expect on Windows, what you'll find is, for example, expect.net. This is basically the same approach that they do. They give a bit more APIs to it, but this is what it ends up looking like. I have a question. Yes. Uh, could you explain a bit why you would use expect? I'm not familiar with expect. Sure. So the question is, why would you actually use expect? So we're in a situation right now where we've been spoiled by commandlets and everything supports automation. But there is a bunch of things out there that can only be automated through interactive usage. So the, you know, the canonical example is needing to like, load up an SSH prompt and start connecting to a machine, interactively typing commands, um, especially when you've got a machine that only supports Telnet as its form of administration. So that's a really typical use case there. Now, we're not here to show you about just the problems. We want to talk to you about a new module that does this in a PowerShell-y and useful way, and it's called Await. So we were talking a bit before, so the typical implementation of Windows is a process that you're in. You see it actually worked for a while. I had some prompts and stuff. So this process <coughs> is now connecting to like a slave process or a driver process. So this is the one that's going to be running your SSH or whatever. And the question is, how do you actually communicate between these two processes in a way that this thing thinks that it's interactive, but at the same time, you're not just using standard input and standard output, because we, as we mentioned, that tends to not work sometimes, especially when you're in a demo. <laughs> now, it turns out that Windows actually has pretty good support for 
doing a, a, a programmatic attaching to another process's console. So there's an API called attach console. Once you connect to a console, you're able to do the, some of the stuff that you can do in PowerShell. So I don't know if you've ever explored the $host.ui, .raw UI. You start to navigate down this, and you get access to the buffer cells, the, the coordinates, the regions. Once you've run attached console, this guy can talk to this guy using those APIs and start to actually extract out text, see when text has changed, and, and start to monitor changes. Now, if you've ever been in the depths of the the attached console and free console APIs, what they'll, no what they'll tell you is that once this guy attaches to the console window of this guy, he no longer has a console window. You're donating your console window and all the interaction is now just in this console window. So if you're sitting in there typing in commands and that console window goes away, you're kind of screwed. So what can we do that's not that? <laughs> the answer is to introduce a sacrificial lamb. <laughs> <laughs> so this process is now the one that calls attach console talking to this con this process. Now you're not going to see that one. It's going to have its console goes away. But what you can do now is have this this main process talking to this one and automating it. Now, as a user, you're still seeing all of your interface. Your console hasn't gone away. This thing can be, if it's PowerShell, it can be a very strong, intelligent PowerShell driver that can run arbitrary commands against your, ultimately, your, you know, your SSH or your Telnet session. But now we're kind of in the same problem we had before. So we had a question about how do you interact between these things. Standard input, standard output, that's not a good way to do it. But now, when we're going from here to here, how does that work out? Are we going to use standard input, standard output again? PowerShell has a lot of ways to do this. Right, so standard input, standard output, that's one of them. That's kind of the problem we started with. Um, you know, when you start a job, actually, you know, start job, whatever, that ends up starting up a background process. So maybe we could start a job and start feeding it commands, and it could send and receive them as it automates this process. That's one option. When it comes to implementation, though, <coughs> the communication between PowerShell and jobs is, again, it's standard input, standard output. We've written, we've written a protocol on top of that, but when this guy calls attach console and talks to this guy, standard input and standard output here gets broken. So if you do this for a job host, <coughs> that's going to break. So we can't do that either. You can imagine temp files, right? So this guy, while you're typing in your commands, these things are creating temp files somewhere. This guy is reading from the temp file somewhere. But there's kind of two things, like that's dirty. You're just leaving files everywhere. Even, even if you try to like clean them up, things crash, you're going to have files everywhere. But the performance is also not the greatest either. You're, you know, you're dumping files on disk. If you want to do it in a good way, they're structured as, you know, CLI XML, importing them off disk again. So that's going to just not be the kind of speed you want. <coughs> One option that actually works really well is remoting. If you connect to yourself, that remoting channel is done through uh, inter-process communication, and that's very, very fast. It's structured. But the downside there is that <laughs> regular users, by default, don't have access to remoting back to themselves. If you've got an ACL on your computer set up to only allow administrators to connect to the machine, then standard users won't be able to use this loopback remoting technique. So remember here we're talking about how do we get commands from here to here and remoting is a great one but um, it's not going to work for this situation. Now the answer is just having to write a bunch of hard code ourselves in a, in a great module and a great bunch of C-sharp 
where we do our own inter-process communication here using the, the pipe support in Windows. So Jim's going to go through that right now, show you how it works. So any questions about, about the uh, architecture or any of the problems that, that the module is trying to solve? Is anyone on? There we go. Yes. So we're going to go through this line by line, just don't you worry. <laughs> did, did, you, did you have any problems? I mean, I know that they changed, I don't know when they changed it, but now an application can only attach to one console. You used to be able to attach to multiple. Um, and that process, that lamp, <coughs> So the, the right. So the two questions were: the Windows API for attached consoles says that um, you know you can't reattach your your old console. Do we run into problems? And the answer is yes. That's why this middle one is a sacrificial lamb. Once it's connected to another process's console, basically it's done with. So that we assume that it's going to come and go. And the second question was around just naming, and um, from a developer, it's not surprising that the name await conflicts with the C sharp async and await keywords. Um, we thought this made a lot of sense given that it was kind of like expectations and very closely mirrored mirrored the expect thing that people are used used to. Yeah, we didn't actually want to use the word expect because it's so much in the it, it means so much. There's so much baggage with it. Await, if you think about this as as being asynchronous, well, the fact of the matter is, is it, it really is uh, in, a, in a bunch of different ways where we f it's a fire and forget sort of situation where you fire the command at the uh, accepting process, he goes off and does something and we'll actually go grab the results and we'll show you that right now. This is the module, the PSM file. Um, um, it, were there any questions about what I said? No? Um, the, the business end starts right here with start await session. Start await session actually spins up the new the new process, connects up the pipes, and uh, gets things going for us. So uh, there's some clever stuff that says, "Hey, if you've already done, if you've already started something, get out. We're not going to do anything for you. Uh, use the one you've got." And then this top two lines you see here, <coughs> one of them is the tricky bit which is the uh, separator line. So uh, we'll, we'll go through that in a little bit with a little bit more detail. But that little string of 20 equals followed by a space followed by a GUID followed by a space followed by 20 equals is the flag that says, hey, dude, I'm all done with my output. Now you can go pick up some stuff. And then we the other business here that happens is we create this uh, pipe name, and that's what the uh, C sharp is actually using to uh, do the communication. Then th next bit that you're seeing here is this script. This we have to get the we have to get the instructions off into this other process. So this script is the is the thing that's going to allow us to do all of this. When we execute this script, it, now I'll get to it in a second. The, the thing that's happening here is this pipe pipe output right line. There you see the result, which is what we're going to be executing, and the separator line. After that, we're starting up a new PowerShell, calling the script, calling the command. Notice that we're hiding the window. Window style is hidden. So that's the reason why you don't see a window flash up. You don't see any of that. Window's actually out of sight. Uh, uh, Sacrificial lamb, right? So it's it's got to go. You can't. You don't want to see this. And then we just hook up. 
we just then the rest of this hooks up the uh, input and output uh, on the client side on the side that you're going to be working on and then lastly down here at the bottom which I'll we'll put up at the top we now send more code down to the remote session by using the invoke await host command we add a type based on a c-sharp file the add um, the types in the c-sharp file and then set up the await driver in that remote process. So this invoke await host command is the thing that we use to communicate with that remote host and we tell it to go add a type to its process and then hook up the, uh, the, the driver based on that type. Because the C sharp file contains the, this await driver uh, type and we create up an instance and that's how the communication is happening so that's, that's the uh, kind of the bootstrapping process. So we create a new process, that sacrificial lamb. And then now that we've got communication with it, now we put in some extra code and, and bring in the library that we're going to use for ultimately automating the, the final target. This function here, just to make sure uh, that we can stop the thing. Speaking of which, I wanted to make sure that everybody saw this, which is actually really cool. At the very top, this business here, the very top, uh, I kind of passed through it earlier. When the module is unloaded, make sure that you kill off the driver. So if you're not using, if you, if you weren't aware of that capability, that's pretty cool. Or you could have, you know, 10 or 20 instances of PowerShell straggling around in the background. This is a great way if you're writing custom modules where you're really worried about the fact that it's clean at the end. This is a great way to ensure that. Put it in a module, put an on remove script block, and you're, and you're good there. This is, the, uh, this is the thing we referenced earlier. This is the thing that sends the command off into uh, the process. It's another commandlet. So the, you, when you start dealing with this, it's going to feel very PowerShell y. You're going to start with the, uh, the start session, then you're going to create and uh, send a command off down the way. and and then you can then pick up, well, I'll show you that in a second. So this is the send command. It says, as you can obviously see, dude, if I don't have an await host, get out. I don't have any way to help you. And then here's some little magic that allows us to uh, send script blocks along the way. We'll do some uh, replacement and then uh, to make sure it's all, uh, we keep track of the script blocks, and then you'll see that we're doing some encoding, which uh, just makes sure that we get uh, get the command down into that child process unmolested. You saw that that section where there is invoke expression. That's that's always always a dangerous thing in scripting, and so this does base sixty four encoding, so that if a user is accidentally typing quotes or brackets or whatever. Um, they're not going to mess up that invoke expression that we did before. And then lastly, uh, we stitch together this command that's going to go down, uh, going to get executed. And again, remember we created in the start session this await driver. And this is where we communicate with that child process by sending the text down to it. Again, we don't want, this, these are double quotes because some of this stuff needs to be expanded and some of it doesn't. So we want to be sure that uh, we send, send down the right, uh, right, uh, right stuff. And then we call invoke await host command with the command that we've created. And that's the thing that we'll go take a look at now. So there you have it. We send it to our pipe, and then we look for our separator. And if we find it, we break and show our content. Uh, shown. If we get the separator, it means we're done. We'll break out of the loop. Otherwise, we'll show the content that we get. So as long as the thing is emitting, as long as that child process, the target process is emitting, We'll not, we won't get our separator line. We'll just keep emitting the content. So that's, that's the uh, context of the script. 
our goal here is in a code review. I kind of want to just show you a little bit of what that, that driver is doing in the background. So we now have this sacrificial lamb that's talking to the actual process you want to automate. So yeah, you don't have to write that. <laughs> this is all the stuff that, and this is, it showed kind of an interesting module technique where uh, the actual implementation and experimentation of this happened in Visual Studio. This was in a C-sharp file that was just a class. I had a program that would kind of interact with it and everything else. But then when that was all done, I just shipped this along with the module, call add type on that exact same path, and now you could use sort of this, this great Windows interop without having to do it all with a bunch of ad type calls or, or complicated scripting. So it's a great way if you're going to be doing a lot of interop to put a bunch of stuff off here in, um, into a C-sharp file. But I know we're not here to look at a bunch of code. Let's uh, let Jim show you some of the neat stuff you can do with this. I don't know if any of you have tried to use FTP from the ISE. It doesn't usually end well. <coughs> Something's happening. I'm not sure what. Let's actually break up like this. It says, I can't now talk to it. It's uh, connected, but uh, help. Ah, help. Ah. That's not a good experience. So let's uh, load up the, the module here. OK, fine. Question. Quick question um, while you're getting that. Um, can this also do things that have their own kind of console, console host, like uh, PuTTY? Would it work in PuTTY, or does it have to be a, a Windows command line tool? So the question is, can this automate uh, <coughs> GUI apps that have a, a kind of a console. And the answer is that this one cannot. Uh, this is specifically for console applications. If you want to automate uh, user interfaces that have a GUI, like PuTTY, there are, are other libraries that are for that. But the problem is there aren't good ones for, well, there's one good one for console automation. Let's <laughs> yeah. this one. So this is the module. These are the these are the uh, these are the things that we can do. So let's uh, let's get cracking here. Rather than switching back and forth, I'll just do these as separate lines here. We'll start up our await session. Now it's there. It is. We can all see. There we go. No, that's still not working. Why is not Control D not working? All right. Now we'll send this FTP. And now if I actually, we can actually see that the FTP process is there. It's not, I've got my console back, so that's good news. I'm actually connected to the local, to the local host. We, we installed the, the local host, uh, uh, the FTP server on this system just because I wanted to be sure that if we could show nothing because we couldn't get a network that we could show this. So now I'm going to send a couple of commands along down the, the, the line here. I'm going to send this, and again. So right now FTP is asking, who are you? So you're, this is as if you're typing by hand, typing who you are. OK. I don't have to worry about anything so far. Now I'll send my, uh, Lee, I hate your keyword. OK. So now I, now I believe I'm logged on. Now I'm going to send a dir command along down the way. 
so far I haven't gotten any output. I haven't taken any output. I haven't decided that I want any output yet. I'm just sending commands down the line. I don't actually have to get the output if I don't want it. Now what I will do is I will receive some response. So if I go now to this thing, I should have a bunch of text. That was not right. Dude. <laughs> the beginning of the text I will show here. Hang on just a second. If it throws an error, like uh, your username login is wrong, you also need to retrieve Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in fact uh, that's in fact probably what's happened here. <laughs> Hang on just a second. So the question was, if it throws an error, how do you handle that? And that's actually kind of the core here of the, the traditional, the, the reason why we talked about this as being sort of a modern version of expect is that the traditional expect on Unix has a mini scripting language that says, if I see this, here's how I can react. If I see this, this is how I can react. It's got a, its own switch statements, its own case statements. But we've invested our careers so far in learning the PowerShell scripting language. And so, those things are absolutely true. You still need to worry about sometimes a command will return different responses, but now you've got the PowerShell scripting language that can go against that received response and try to figure out what to do. Totally and especially the other thing that comes into play is timing. Sometimes it'll be a long wait <laughs> before a directory listing is done. And so being able to receive a response and wait for a prompt, for example, is a very, very helpful thing so that you're not having to worry about, you know, putting in sleep for 30 seconds just in case. This is totally broken. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Hang on a second. Let's start this all over again. Can you also run it in a verbose mode so that you, um, so that you can see? Yeah, the question is, can you run this in a verbose mode to see what's happening? And so there, uh, the receive await command is the receive await command does let you access the text that it currently knows about. So that's a great debugging thing is to say, receive await command, see what's there. That's what, in fact what I just did. Um, I'm going to just type it by hand here. Um, so as you can see, what I've done here is it at the bottom of the text. It says, I'm now connected with uh, the uh, user. F um, it's a actually now prompting me for wh who my user is. So I will send that user down the line here. Send await command anonymous. <coughs> and then I can receive the await command or the await response. Await response. And it says, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and that's the reason why this isn't working. I'm not sure why that's going on. So, uh, sadly, we command FTP localhost. Yeah, this is... Uh, The question is, is there no way to have the output come back to PowerShell itself? And that could happen. The answer is that the design of this is around things that you do want to always automate. You know, it would be really easy to write a little wrapper command for when you're starting to diagnose a session or debug a session. Right. User is logged in, yay. So now I can send my send send a command. How big is the buffer for the received uh, response? The question is how big is the buffer for the received response? And the answer is it's as big as the actual console buffer. This is literally attaching to a console buffer in the background and monitoring the text in there. So if you change your default settings for consoles and stuff, <coughs> it will also apply to the uh, the hidden Correct. The, the question is, if, if you change your default console settings, will that apply to these? <coughs> and the answer is yes. This is 
100% to automate the, the interaction with the console application. That actually may be what the problem is. Yes, that's what I'm. Uh, that's where I'm actually headed. Um, so now I send anonymous send await command anonymous. I have logged on. And I can actually determine. I can actually show that it's now giving me waiting for a pass. Wait, waiting for me to send a password. Await command, and I'm going to use the usual anonymous password, which is uh, foo.com. Yes, because nobody ever fills those out. And now I'm actually logged onto the system. Now I can actually send an await command. And now I can receive. And those are the files that are actually in the FTP directory. There's a bunch of bunch of documents and a bunch of pictures that I put in there earlier. Question. Can you send multiple commands The question is, can you send multiple commands in one line? Uh, and the answer is the send await command is really just sending uh, those key presses via the console, and then pushing enter. So you could send, there's a, a send await command has a parameter, which is, uh, I think, dash node new line, that will just send in the raw text, and you can keep on running that if you wanted to. Um, or, you know, the, the command separator, your question about this, the multiple commands, there really is no command separator. This is just what you're sending to the remote process. So like a semicolon, you know, for PowerShell that might be a command separator, but for other things it might not be. It might, if it's an email, right, it's just going to be text. What about backtick r, backtick n? The question is, what about backtick r, backtick n? That stuff's just going to go into your target process. Whatever that means, that's what it's going to be. So that will be the character return line, so that, that's what you can do in multiple commands. Then. Really? Mm -hmm. Right. The, the, the question is, would, would special characters in PowerShell like backtick R, backtick N be converted into new lines and stuff? Uh, yes, if you use double quotes, because that conversion is happening at, happening at the client side, the automation side. But if you're using single quotes, that's literally sending everything that you want into the target process. And so there's going to be no escaping, except for a little bit, which uh, Jim will show you in a second. And it's a, it's a different escaping syntax. So this bit of code that I've just run here, I've just popped up some GUI. The, the, the interesting thing here is that I've collected some lines out of the output from uh, the FTP dir command, and I've popped that into a grid view. So now what I can do is I can actually select a couple of files. And now I've got in my selection, I've got this set of files. And if I keep going down the, the rest of my script, what will actually happen is I'll be able to download multiple files by calling, first I'll set the bin mode on the, uh, on the FTP connection. And then I will get each one of those files. And if everything works, I'll actually have local files here in this system32 directory, which is going to be bad. <laughs> Let's see if I'm too late. Um, I probably am. Um, yeah. I'm too late. Yes. This console. The, background. the question is, would it put the files, what we just did, would it have put the files into this console or the background console? So the, the command itself is being run on that, so that third process is actually being automated. Um, by default, that directory is going to be the same one that's the default directory for that PowerShell instance. So if it was launched as admin, 
then that's going to be the working directory, and you'd want to do a change in that one. It doesn't matter the directory that you're in in the ISE. Right. Yeah, and question. How, how is the text encoding handled? Is it UTF-8 all the way? Or, for example, CalNet supports uh, color, uh, as, um, ANSI escape codes, and uh, let's say that you have you have on a on a on a console application that you want to automate. You have uh, a prompt that says input command in two different colors. And when you get that into your your console, it's and you can't, you can't really match on that thing, right? Because it, it's going to have all these weird escape characters. Uh, is there any way you can uh, make it? I don't know, plain text when you when you get it over. Yeah. So the question is, if you're trying to automate a program that that does some extensive screen manipulation, so for example, different colors, how do you actually do and expect on that output? And the answer is that we're extracting from that final target console in, in just regular text. We're not extracting anything. Also, most apps are strong, uh, smart enough to know that um, if you connect up with a terminal that doesn't support ANSI escape sequences, then they'll fall back to a plain text mode. So I'm going to move on to the next demo because we're running out of time. This is actually calling VI from the Vim, pack, from the Vim package and it's going to create a file uh, in my home directory called foo.txt. So if everything works, what will happen is I'll create this file foo.txt and you'll see that, th that I'm actually removing it before I do it, before, I, uh, before anything else. The one thing I want to bring your, to your attention uh, if you're familiar with VI, you'll understand what this says. If you're not, there's no hope anyway. <laughs> so the only thing I really want to talk about is line 13. Because uh, if you're familiar with VI, you know it is a bimodal sort of environment where if you're in command mode or you're in insert mode, and the way you get in and out of insert mode is, or command and, and, uh, and insert mode is through the escape key. So I have to figure out some way to send an escape key. And in fact, we have it. All I have to do is that. So I can send bracket escape bracket. Remember earlier on where we had that uh, shenanigans with the, the braces turning into replacing the, br re the braces in the send command? This is the reason why. I want to be able to make sure that if I'm sending a script block, I want to be able to sure it gets through. But if I'm sending escape, I want to make sure that that gets through unmolested. Does that make sense? Clear is one of the things that we blew through in that C sharp code was the actual how to interpret these characters that you're sending. So we don't interpret the PowerShell backtick R backtick N. The language is, is more similar to what you use in Windows automation with uh, send keys, if you've ever used that before. So paren escape, paren enter. You'll also notice that I'm using the wait, the wait response. So I'm actually looking for a tilde. In uh, in VI, so I'll just execute this critter. Does the await session always start with the same credentials as the session from which you started, or can you influence the, the credentials that the, that the background session starts with? The question is, does the the original await session launch with your regular user creds, or can you launch it under alternate ways? Uh, and the answer is that ultimately, the await session you spawn is PowerShell. If you wanted to launch another thing with different creds, you can absolutely automate the first couple lines to launch a new process as another user. But by default, there is, there's no additional things for like username, working directory, password. So I just finished executing this guy. <coughs> it was done while Lee was talking. The cool ISE steroids actually told me that it took 1.855 seconds to run. So that's pretty awesome. Let's go off here and uh, <coughs> see if I've got a file. <coughs> oh. And if you're familiar with VI, and if you're not, there's no hope, um, you can see that what I did with this file is I created a line, I inserted a line that said this is a test, then I sent uh, a, an escape sequence and I deleted the line, I wrote the file and then actually what I did is I replaced every instance of lowercase test with uppercase test and then I went to the uh, first line, I yanked the, the line, then I sent one to a hundred times, I repasted that this is a test with a capital T into the thing, I wrote and I quit 
That's how it works. Perfectly e easy to understand. <laughs> and then I stopped the session, and then the file was uh, was created, the Wu text. You can tell that I'm not doing any smoke and mirrors whatsoever because I actually, at the beginning of the script, make sure that I remove the file. So there's, I'm not playing any games here. In fact, I can do it again if you really want, but I don't think you really want. <coughs> Lastly, the last demo that I want to show is this little script, which actually goes... It's going to do something pretty spectacular. This is a script that will uh, automate access to an Azure instance running Linux via SSH. Via PowerShell. Via PowerShell. <laughs> now, in order for me to do that, I need a username and password. So uh, I've got a username and password here on this disk, on this uh, S is on uh, this thing, whatever it is. It's a uh, because Lee's pretty sketchy. I don't want him to have my passwords or anything. So let's go through this a little bit. I'm going to go and run SSH. It's available with the Git package. I'm going <coughs> to wait for the word password because I'm using sending along the uh, username, which is uh, I can show you what that is later. Uh, if you're really interested, it doesn't matter. It's a user on the cloud app.net uh, instance. I'm then going to send the password. I'm going to wait for my prompt. I'm going to get you name. I'm going to wait for some prompt. I'm going to actually do some interaction here. So let's take a look. I better do this. OK, hopefully everything will work. I would like, I think, to do it this way. There we go. So you'll actually see the output as it goes. I'll just hold on to the question for a second. We've got a few minutes. We can chat afterwards. Okay. <coughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happened here. One thing I failed to do is output the actual lines. Good for me. Perfect. <laughs> so if this had all worked just right, it would have done the right thing, but it didn't. I don't know why yet. Answer the question, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You had a question. Uh, uh, actually, it's it just a really quick one. It's not going to be able to kill as much time as you hope, I think. Um, it's just, can you, when you're uh, doing those um, await, await response, await, await response, can you issue a timeout so that like, if, it, if you don't receive the response within X number of seconds, it will fail or, or return so that you can handle that? Yes, the code isn't written to do that yet, but yes. That's a load it. Also, have a question? question and answer a couple more times. <laughs> I think we're. I think we're out of time. Yeah, Sorry, it, it really does work. <laughs> <laughs> but this is still being developed. Uh, we <coughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> wrote the demos in the last couple of days. Lee wrote the expect code at the end of last week. Wow. Okay. Jim, what, so where are your test cases? Stick. There are no yet. There are no yet test cases. There will be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but as for the current, no. Not, not yet, because we're not done yet. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for your time. Damn it. Did we not push it when we started?